You are listening to the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast, driven by Cornerstone Gun Dog Academy. CGA is the world's most comprehensive online gun dog training resource, with over 160 instructional videos, including everything that you need to take a seven week old puppy to a finished gun dog. Visit CornerstoneGunDogAcademy.com to sign up for their pre- free preview module and begin your training journey today. Cornerstone Gun Dog Academy, the world's most advanced gun dog training resource on the web. You are listening to the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast, episode 119. This week on the show, we're digging into the inbox. We're going to go over some of the questions that we've received from you, the listeners, from our email and from our Facebook, and hopefully uh, shed a little light for the rest of you guys that might have the same questions. All right. Welcome to this, the 119th episode of the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast. This week, driven by Cornerstone Gun Dog Academy and Quack Rack. Quack Rack is a premium decoy and gear hauling solutions for your UTV or boat. 100% 100% American made, front racks, roofs, roof baskets, and rear racks. You can get an inside look by checking out the episode 75 of the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast, and also follow Quack Rack on Facebook and Instagram, and by checking out the hashtag Haul More, Shoot More. Visit quackrack.com today. Welcome to the show. Excited to have you here. We're your on demand audio source for all things waterfowl and waterfowl hunting. If you're new to the show, welcome. Make sure you head over to hpoutdoors.com. Check out all the past episodes we've got over there for you. If you're new to the show, you can also find us on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, iHeartRadio, all the great places where you can find podcast content on the internet. You can find our show. You can also catch us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. If you're on Facebook, head over to our listeners group. Check out what we got going on in there. Say what's up to my co-host, Dan Harushka. Dan, what's up? Not too much, my man. I found out that uh, Coca-Cola has always been brown. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, you. Uh, that was a letdown for sure. Not gonna lie, a little bit of what I need to, uh, I need to vet my sources. Yeah, yeah, you do. Live and you learn, right? Yeah, whatever. <laughs> well, this week we're going to talk about some listeners' questions. We get a lot of questions here to the show via our email at info at hboutdoors dot com. We also get a ton of info uh, questions on our Facebook listeners group, where we've got a lot of guys in there that are uh, more than willing to talk shop and be helpful and. Uh, discuss a lot of things waterfowl and waterfowl hunting so we we've got a couple questions that we've pulled off of there as well to share so we'll we'll run through some questions here this week and you know there's probably a lot of folks out there listening to this show that have some similar questions to what we're going to go over today and uh, hopefully we'll help you all out as well if you have a question or concern or something you want to talk about feel free to shoot us an email at info at hpoutdoors.com hit us up on social media with that question we'll answer you there and then we like to compile questions here every so often and do listener uh, question episodes so that we make sure that we uh, share all of that information with everyone listening. So we love those. Keep sending them in and uh, we'll keep helping you to the best that we can. Before we get too much further down the road this week, I do want to take a minute just to thank Gunner Kennels, engineered for your dog and designed for travel. Built for your peace of mind, the G1 Kennel has set the new industry standard and put Gunner Kennels in a category all its own. Gunner Kennels was started to protect your pet, and it continues to be at the, every, the center of everything that they do. They're dedicated to building the best and safest pet travel crate on the market because man's best friend deserves man's best kennel. Check out their G1 series of kennels and accessories at GunnerKennels.com. Also to 737 Duck and Goose Calls, original design, select grade components, superior sound, and unparalleled service. 737 takes exceptional pride in producing the finest quality, best-built premium calls in the market today. They're made right here in America and offered only direct to customers through their website. Shipping in the U.S. is always free, and international orders can now be accepted online. 20-day money-back guarantee and a lifetime warranty accompanies every call purchased. 737 duck calls lead the flock. Also, thank you to Dunn's Sporting Goods. Dunn's is a family-owned and operated business with two locations, Peavely, Missouri, and Marion, Illinois. They've got over 60 years dedicated to providing the outdoorsmen with the best deals on hunting and fishing gear. Check out their selection at shopduns.com as well as on Facebook and Instagram at shopduns. Check out for weekly specials and giveaways. They've also created a discount code for the listeners of our show. So you can use the code HPO to save 10% on your purchase. Some restrictions do apply. 
We appreciate all the companies that support our show. We also appreciate the companies that provide discount codes for the listeners of our show. So head over to the HP Outdoors website, check out the discounts tab, find out how you can save a bunch of money with a lot of great companies. So we certainly appreciate them and everything that they offer us. All right, Dan. So we're going to cover some listener questions this week. But before we get into that, there is a few things that we wanted to that I wanted to, to bring up here. And uh, mostly of note is the fact that the recommendations for the Atlantic Flyway, Mallard, and Canada Geese uh, bag limits and season changes have been accepted. So it looks like it's officially official that that is what a change that will be coming to our flyway here next year. Yeah, that's not... I'm. <laughs> It's the mixed emotions are like overwhelming because, you know, two mallards and depending where you are, three geese down to two geese or two geese down to one goose. And it's tough. But at the same time, you understand that these changes are not made for the hunter. You know, they're made to for the resource. So it's tough. And I know a lot of people are upset about it, but it's something that we got to do. And um, it's going into effect if you like it or not. Yeah. I mean, obviously... There's nothing we can do about it as hunters. Uh, but I think that's a great point, you know, understanding that the regulations are set forth for the resource, not for the hunter necessarily. And, you know, I think the thing that, that I'm hopeful is that it's just hopefully this is not long term. You know, I mean, the, the the declining numbers and things have been trending that way for quite some time. Hopefully that this is something that will be effective and it will provide, uh, you know, a bounce back to those numbers to where they're more comfortable raising the limits again. Um, But more so than raising the the limit adjustment to me is the fact that they're cutting the the Canada goose season to 30 days. That is a significant cut because, you know, here where we hunt, a lot of times you can do a mixed bag hunt, right? So you can go out and you can have a chance to shoot a couple honkers, maybe a couple mallards, wood ducks, you know, ring necks, whatever. When you, when you cut it to 30 days, you know, you really, if you're a weekend hunter, you got like four weekends. And if you're in Maryland where you can't hunt Sundays, you're hunting Saturdays, right? And you got basically four Saturdays roughly uh, to hunt. So that right there is the, is the dagger to me. Um, shooting two versus one, you know, that's unfortunate, but I mean, let's be honest, it's one bird. It's not the, it's not the end of the world. To me, cutting the season length is down even is, is the harder part because you're, you're restricting, uh, you know, time that people have to get in the field. And I've talked about this a lot, right? You know, if you have kids sports mm-hmm. and you're trying to get kids into the field, like that just makes it so much harder to do. So uh, it's unfortunate. Hopefully it's not a long-term thing, but um, it does appear that that is going to be uh, put in place next year. And that's going to be the reality. Although they did, they did clarify, you know, and I think this was some mis- misunderstanding in the early parts. This, these changes are only going to affect the AP zone of the migratory flyway. It's not the entire Atlantic flyway. It is the AP portion of that, uh, that flyway. So your resident populations and things like that are not affected by these regulations. Yeah, that's a, it's a, well, I'm not sure how big it is down there, Philly, like as far as Pennsylvania goes. I know what the whole Eastern shore is AP zone. So that's going to hurt them pretty bad down there. But um, our AP zone here, like where we're at, you know, it's between 18 and 79. So it's not, it's only a few miles wide and um, a lot of, a lot of more people in the RP zone anyway. So it is what it is. And it kind of now correlates with the SJBP zone. And that's not a, a huge change for us as far as locally, but yeah, those guys down in Maryland, Eastern Shore, I I feel for them a bit. Yeah, I think you know portions of <clears throat> portions of New York, uh, maybe Eastern Pennsylvania, some areas, um, you know Maryland, Delaware. Uh, for Virginia, it's the it's the kind of extreme southeast portion of the state. So all the way up, uh, you know, through DC and stuff like that is not in the AP zone. So like where I'm hunting in this area, uh, this whole northern part of our state should not be really affected by this, uh, this, you know, change in the, the Canada goose regulation. So, uh, the mallards I'm assuming will be, will be affected, you know, across the board, but, uh, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so not the best of news, but again, it could be worse. They could have, they could have said, we're going to shut it off. Right. You know I mean? At least we're seeing incremental steps to try to correct the problem and then they're not, you know, hopefully they didn't swing too far. 
kind of deal. So that right. was uh, something that came across my uh, radar this week that um, you know was kind of noteworthy. So I did want to mention that to anybody that was unsure if that was actually going to happen. And there is, there are some good articles out there put out by, um, I believe the one that I saw was put out by uh, Ducks Unlimited. They, they talk a little bit about specific areas that will be affected. So definitely uh, search that up if, you, if you're looking for more info. <laughs> Yeah, and this is another another reminder just to keep an eye out for your regulations and check them yearly because if people don't get on Facebook, if they don't, you know, listen to podcast episodes or anything like that, and then they go out and start shooting geese like normal, you know, it, it could be a, a big fine in your pocket. So uh, make sure wherever you're at, you should be checking those, those limits all the time. Yeah, I definitely uh, would echo that as, you know, as a hunter, it's your responsibility to know the rules, right? You can't say, mm-hmm. well, I didn't know, or I didn't see that, or, you know, that's, that's not a viable excuse. Okay. You gotta, you gotta know it's your responsibility. So, uh, the resources are available, check them out. And, uh, if you don't, if you're unsure, make sure you ask somebody, you know, reach out to a state level, um, you know, game, game warden or DNR officer or something like that. And uh, make sure you get clarification before you kind of step out of line there inadvertently. Um, yep. okay. Let's go ahead and turn the page here. Uh, before we get into our discussion of the week, I do um, want to roll into the You Can Uba tip of the episode brought to you by Barton Ramsey of Cornerstone Gun Dog Academy. We're going to be having these tips uh, every other week. So this week we are up again. And he's got another great, uh, a great point here. We're kind of building off of his first tip uh, about getting used to the puppy and stuff. So why don't we go ahead and uh, roll through that and... Um, we can uh, chat about that on the other side. So without further ado, here you go. This week's You Can Uba tip of the episode. Hey guys, this is Barton Ramsey from Cornerstone Gundog Academy, and this is your retriever training tip of the episode brought to you by You Can Uba. Today I want to talk about crate training. Crate training is essential no matter whether you're getting a gun dog or a family pet, any type of dog that's going to be living in your home, you're going to want to crate train. And this is sometimes called potty training or house breaking. And the idea is that you use the crate as a location where the dog hopefully will not relieve himself or herself because it's a small quarters, it's small enough for a puppy to just be able to stand up, turn around, move around a little bit, but not go into one side to the bathroom and then move to the other side to sleep. So you want to choose a small crate and you want to introduce the puppy to the crate with positive things, either putting a blanket or a toy in there, feeding the puppy, watering the puppy in the crate. The basic idea of crate training is anytime that you cannot keep an eye on your puppy, that you cannot physically see your puppy in the house, he needs to be in the crate. And so you're using the crate as a safety zone and then you take the puppy straight from the crate outside Allow the puppy to use the the toilet, restroom, potty, whatever word you want to use. Once they do this, give them a reward, verbal praise or a treat. Bring them back inside. Monitor the puppy for a little while. And then before you put the puppy back in the crate, take it back outside again. Try to find the same spot so that the puppy has a correlation. This spot is where I relieve myself. And then once they've gone to the bathroom again, put them in the crate. You want to be careful and not leave the puppy in the crate for too long. Don't overdo it when it comes to leaving a puppy in the crate. Uh, Sometimes young puppies can't make it through the night, and so you'll want to set an alarm or they'll be the alarm for you to wake you up. Make sure you take them out if they make noise in the middle of the night. Otherwise, in the daytime, you don't want to let a puppy out of the crate until he's quiet. You want to make sure that they're not being able to get out by making noise. Otherwise, they're always going to make noise thinking this will get me out. So wait till the puppy is quiet, and once the pup's quiet, reward him, take him out, and the first place you go every time you take a puppy out of the crate is to go to the bathroom outside. Don't let them come out and then walk around. That's a a recipe for an accident in your house. Be consistent with your pup. Don't expect too much. When you fail, just start back over, push reset, and maintain the same standards of go to the bathroom, then in the crate, out of the crate, straight to the bathroom, and then in the house only when under supervision. All right. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this week's You Can Uba tip of the episode with Barton Ramsey from Cornerstone Gundog Academy. You know, Dan, I think uh, crate training is very, very important, as Barton highlights. And, you know, it was one of the things, you know, my, my dog is not a gun dog, but, you know, all of that, when you uh, create that transition, you know, coming home and having that safe space and understanding how 
uh, how it can be structured to help you learn the potty training uh, process and things like that. It's also very, very critical and being consistent with your behavior and how you handle that is so important for a dog that's learning and trying to just kind of get the ropes and stuff. And that sets him up for future successes when you know he can, he or she can count on you as the handler to be consistent and give consistent praise or and f- consistent feedback so that the dog can learn and not be confused. And, um, you know, that, that only is going to benefit you down the road as you continue down your training journey. Yeah. Consistency is the key. And, you know, just getting that routine in place, you come home, you take him right out, like he was saying, um, and even one thing that that really sparked my mind was talking about going to the same place, going potty, you know, and um, Alex, who we had on first aid, he he moved to a new state and he has a big backyard now. And I was like, man, whenever you take your dogs out, just walk them on that tree line in the back of your yard and, um, you know, make sure they go potty there and then they'll just start going there. That'll be their place. So he, <laughs> he messaged me a couple of days later and he said that his dog doesn't, you go to the restroom anywhere near his house. It's always in the like back quarter of his yard, which was super cool to hear. So, you know, right off the bat, even older dogs will, will learn that trick. And, um, another thing Barton was talking about, which is probably the most difficult is not letting a puppy out when they're crying and that, you know, some long nights I'm sure. But, uh, once you, once you, if you break from them crying and let them out, then that will never end. So, you know, hold strong for the first couple of days and, and make, make that the routine. Yeah. It's so it's so brutally hard too, because they have no quit. I remember my dog's first night in the crate was like four or five hours solid. And I just mm-hmm. was like ready to freak out, <laughs> but you're right. You know, they, they don't forget things like that. And when you do it once, it's so hard to, to come back. So <laughs> dig in, suck it up, just know what you're getting into. And, you know, it's always like interesting. Cause it's like, it's almost like when you're potty training a kid, you know, it's like you pick a weekend where it's like, you got a long weekend or something like that. You got nothing else planned and you're just going to stick the kid on the pot every 30 minutes. Like, so that, till they get it right. It's like, yep. you know, you just have to brace yourself and be like, I got nothing else going on right now. Then just making sure I don't, you know, I keep this dog in the crate like during the period of time that needs to be and staying consistent and things like that because it's just so important to kind of get that consistency. So great point by Barton this yeah. week. And um, I'm loving these you can do tips of the tips of the week. And I look forward to them coming every other week. So I think with that, let's go ahead and turn the page and transition a little bit again and get into this week's topic of listener questions. And again, as I mentioned earlier in the episode, we, we pull these questions from emails that we get into our email personally uh, at info at hpldoors.com. We pull these off of our Facebook group, people just asking questions in conversation. If I see something that I think is a good question that a lot of people might benefit from, we'll grab that. Or if I see something where we're getting the same question a lot, right? Like a lot of people have the same question, we'll, we'll, we'll note that too. And I think the one thing that I want to point out about these questions is, is they sort of span the gamut, right? Some of them may be basic. A lot of, you know, if you guys have hunted for a while, you know, you might be like, yeah, that, that you know, that I don't have that question. Like that's not even a thing, but there's a lot of guys listening to our show that either have started just this season or are thinking about starting and haven't actually hunted yet. So like we try to kind of cover as much of the spectrum as that we, as we can to uh, ensure that everybody hopefully can get a little something out of it. Some of these questions. So as we go through this, you know, we may expand a little bit on the question to sort of add a few more tips in to maybe make a little more, a little more depth to the answer, perhaps. But uh, you know, for the most part, we want to make sure that we we try to get a little bit of something for everybody. So, uh, without further ado, Dan, what do you think? You ready to get started with this? Let's do it. All right. So the first question that we get, we got this that caught my attention, and we get this one a lot, right? I mean, this is one that's very, very common. Uh, the question, uh, and I'm not gonna like read these. I just kind of made notes as to what they were, but essentially the question was, uh, about mixing decoys and particularly mixing wood ducks with mallard decoys. Okay. So a lot of guys that are getting started, they either buy, uh, used or get hand me down or whatever. I mean, they don't have a big selection of decoys. So they worry about, well, can I use them all? I've only got 20, but they're like mixed species. And, you know, can I throw them all together? What do I do? I think, uh, you know, for me, the one thing that I would say is, you know, obviously your scout should tell you what you need to do, right? If you see wood ducks and mallards swimming together, mix them up. If for some reason you see them separated, 
separate your spread, right? Um, but what I will say is, generally speaking, in my experience, and again, this is my experience, it's not the gospel, wood ducks and mallards have no problem mingling together and, and play pretty nice. Um, where I've seen the most issues with species mingling together and playing nice is on the diver duck side of the house. Uh, historically, you know, buffle heads tend to group up together. Uh, golden eyes will do the same. They like to buff, uh, group up together. Um, having said that, I've killed a ton of buffle heads over spreads of canvas backs and bluebills. You know, like it can be done, but those are two that I know of that tend to want to be with their own kind. So typically when I'm setting up a diver spread, I will set my buffle heads and my um, golden eye type decoys a little bit separated kind of on their own um, just because that's what I see where I hunt. And that's been my experience. But what do you think, Dan? Uh, being up here, you know, Northern Pennsylvania, we have wood ducks for, uh, about the first month of the season, but we get teal that, you know, they'll stick around the green wings will stick around for a while, but our opening, uh, spread will consist of wood ducks, mallards, and teal. Um, I think there's never been an issue. I've never seen anything that would, uh, make me change that or think otherwise that we're not approaching it the correct way. One thing that I always do is have a jerk rig on the wood ducks and I'm not sure why I do that, but it seems like, you know, a lot of people will say, you know, wood ducks don't, don't decoy. Some people say that they certainly do decoy. It seems where we hunt, they know that they want to be in a certain spot. So we get on the X and we hunt them there. And it's once we started using the jerk rig, with the wood ducks, I mean, those things dive bomb right onto them. So if you have them around and you're just getting into it, get a jerk rig set up, get them on your wood ducks, and, man, when they're starting to come in, just pull on them a little bit, and, and you should get some shooting in. Yeah, and that's something that I'll add for you guys out there that are getting started and getting hand-me-down uh, you know, spreads or buying used or whatever. Um, if you're looking to just get started – rigging up some sort of jerk rig system that you can do, or you can buy one commercially, but getting something in your spread that will move mo water on the top, you know, like create motion in the water is very, very important. Uh, you know, a lot of guys see spinning wing decoys and stuff on TV and that's what they want to put up and those can work too. But it's so critical, as you mentioned, to have something to disturb the surface of the water and create that, that motion, um, the jerk rig is, is perfect for that. And you can create them yourself, DIY, pretty easy. You can buy a nice commercial one. Uh, you know, there's a lot of options out there to, to accomplish that task, but it's definitely one that you shouldn't overlook. And it doesn't matter if you're putting w uh, wood ducks on there or mallards or teal, something to stir the water up and get that, get that motion going, uh, will help you out. So mix them yeah, up. If, if, uh, if you think that's right, was... if, if you're worried about it, spread them out a little bit, you know, you're not you're probably going to hurt yourself either way. I was going to say, we hunt so many times either in, you know, little ponds or, you know, swampy areas with, with dead trees. I don't want to quite call it timber, but, um, made some, some dead timber standing. And usually there's not too much wind there. So if you're in a, a stream or a river, yeah, you have enough movement where you don't need one. But if you're just starting out, even, you know, wrap some fishing line onto one of your decoys and, and yank on that for a little bit, see if it makes a difference for you. Yep, no doubt. All right, let's move on. This is a question that came up just recently, and I thought it was an interesting one. And uh, the question was essentially, you know, if you're hunting ducks and you've got geese decoys out there that you're using for confidence and things like that, are you going to blow a duck call at those ducks if you don't have any duck decoys out, or are you going to blow a goose call? And I'll let you go first on this one. Um. I would keep blowing a duck call. I would probably, well, I would start out with a duck call. And if it's not, if I see anything that seems out of the ordinary, I would probably go to goose. If I saw any geese, I would be calling to geese. And I think when we were out in Kansas, we had a full goose set up in the field. And I know a lot of the times there were a lot of geese coming and we were calling to geese and ducks were dive bombing in, in on us. So, um, you know, calling to geese over a goose spread for ducks works. I've seen it. And I think, you know, we definitely killed ducks over those goose decoys too. So 
by calling ducks. So I think either way would work, honestly. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think your fir- <laughs> your your first thing to do would be to call ducks. So even if you're hunting a goose spread and you see ducks, use a duck call. But don't be afraid. And this is just my opinion. I'm not going to be afraid to blow my goose call too a little bit because mm-hmm. the reason why a lot of times we put geese out is because they can be seen the more confidence for your ducks, right? You can also, you can blow a goose call pretty loud. You can cover a lot of range with goose calls, particularly if you're hunting on water, you can blow that thing and and get out there. And so my, my calling technique would probably change. You know, I'm not going to be sitting there like running them hard and kind of trying to call them in. I'm probably more trying to convey a sound of relaxation and confidence and just kind of like whatever. Um, Again, I do think the duck call is probably your primary uh, thing to do. But if you're hunting in an area, and I've this is like this is what I what I come to, where I hunt, as soon as the sun comes up, and the ducks start flying, and they fly down the river, every time they pass a blind, you hear quack 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 quack. Right? Everyone's just crushing those duck calls, and those ducks just are like, all right, and they keep going. Right? In a day, in, in a situation where you're trying to be different and you're trying to stand out and convince. A flock of ducks that, hey, that spread's not the place to be. My spread is the place to be. Doing the same thing that everything else, everyone else is doing is not going to do it for you. You have to mix it up. You have to be different. So incorporating that goose call is not going to hurt you. Definitely not going to hurt you, and it can only help you. Maybe it will. Maybe it won't. But I would never rule that out. I wouldn't rule anything out, okay? Hunting is too unpredictable, right? You never know what's going to work on any given situation. The day you got it figured out, you don't. Okay. The second you think you know everything, you definitely don't. So just try something different. Don't be afraid to blow the duck of the goose call. If it doesn't work, put it back in your pocket, right? What's the, what's the, the harm that you can do? But my thought is if you're using geese to visually communicate confidence, why would the sound of geese communicating confidence be any different or any less effective? That's my two cents. Anything else no, to add to that's, that? That's, that's all good points. And, you know, I've never really said... <laughs> You know, after talking to Field and Clay Hudden all about their goose setup for ducks, I've never had that um, that amount of goose decoys out compared to duck decoys. So I think I'll probably transition to that more just to see how it works. And I'll probably put this theory to the test and, and use the goose call and see if it calls in more ducks. Yeah, why not? Can't hurt. All right, here we go. Why not? Might as well try it. This is another question that came in that's right up your alley. Diver spreads. How heavy of a weight are you going to use on your single rigged diver decoys, Dan? <laughs> um, <laughs> since I am not the the big diver guy, um, but I do hunt divers, and when I do, I just put those four either depending on the day, either the four ounce uh, lifetime decoy rigs or their six ounce. That's what I do for single. But again, that's on a lake with, uh, you know, not a ton of chop. I don't get out on the big lakes like Lake Erie or the river. So that one I might transition off to you. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to say for most people, a uh, four ounce is not going to be enough. Um, I'll caveat this by saying I don't bring any of my diver decoys on singles. I run them all on long lines. Uh, but mm-hmm. if you're going to run singles. I would say a minimum of six ounces, sometimes eight, depending on what you need. Because what what I will run is my uh, honker floaters. And if the water's shallow enough, I'll run them on lifetime rigs. But if it's not, I, I need more length. And, and you still need, I need eight to 10 ounces on those with wind and tide and chop and all that kind of stuff. So definitely a little bit heavier is what you're going to want to do. But a lot of it just depends on your water depth, right? I mean, if you're if you're running, you know, ten feet of water and you've got like twelve foot of decoy line, you're gonna need more weight because you're not gonna get a good angle and good drag, and that 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 that's gonna slide. Or if you're running like a smooth bottom river or something where you don't have a lot of vegetation for the thing to wrap up in and that kind of stuff, um, you know, you're gonna need a little bit more weight. So I I always go minimum six, sometimes eight, uh, for my individually rigged, but. What I would say is if you're going to hunt divers, 
long lines are the way to go. If you want to set big numbers of decoys quickly and then pick them up quickly, more importantly, um, long lines is the way to go. The way I run is I run the long, the lifetime long lines, five, five pounds on either end of the line. And I've hunted on, on tidal river wind. The only thing that has ever moved my lines with five, five pounds on either end of them is ice. Ice will destroy decoy lines um, when it breaks mm-hmm. up and it starts shifting with tide and stuff like that. But for everything else, five pounds for me has been plenty. Um, if you hunt areas with stronger tide or heavier winds, you may need a little bit more, but um, always err on the side of caution and go a little bit heavier because when you're hunting divers on big water, sometimes you know you can get into deeper water depth and uh, tide and, and decoys can get away from you very, very quickly. So I know a lot of people that have lost decoys hunting them with single droppers specifically. So, um, you know, my choice is long lines, but if you're going to go single rig, uh, definitely go up a weight than probably what you think you need. So six or eight would be the minimum recommendation that I would go with. Yeah, I agree with that. And that's, I mean, if you're in a pond or something or, you know, somewhere that doesn't get a ton of wind or chop or anything like that, but if you're getting, you know, a couple, couple foot waves coming in, you know, you have to, you have to prepare for that or else they're going to be picking up and everything will be back on shore or out in the middle of the lake. So you definitely don't want any of that going on. Yeah. And, and, and more problematic than that is you don't want your lines or your decoys blowing together and just getting all tangled up. Then you got a freaking mess you got to deal with out on the water. And if right. it's cold, your hands are freezing, you know, it's just a nightmare. So definitely get them some space, weight them down nice and nice and good and, uh, you know, have a good hunt. All right. This year was the first year that I used the the long line because everywhere I hunt divers, I can walk, I can wade out and set decoys, but it definitely was quite a bit easier to use long line. Just you know, take even, them right up and let I, them set. If out. I can walk, I love setting long lines when I can walk. I love it. Mm-hmm. That's the best. That is the absolute yep. best scenario because you can just yep. put the put the the bin in the boat, stand beside it, and pull them out and just chuck them as you walk grab the end, drag them where you need them. Like it's super easy and it's super fast. And you got to remember when you're hunting divers, unlike puddle ducks, they're flying low on the water. Okay. So you don't need to have a bunch of individually rigged, like set up, uh, you know, with like a kill hole and all this kind of stuff, because when they're on the water flying at a lower angle, it just looks like a raft of ducks when they're, when they're coming, approaching the long lines, if you stagger them right, and then you have the string kind of going in the direction of where they would assume uh, the ducks are feeding. So, you know, like we talked about last week, they're going to fly up those lines because they're going to say, okay, these ducks are feeding. I want to fly ahead of them and jump up because they're on the good food, right? So I want to get there before they have a chance to pick it over. So a lot of times they're either going to come up the line or if you're hunting high pressured areas, they're going to fly right on the edge, the outer edge of that as they kind of uh, check out and see what's going on. So if you got the end of your lines at like 40 yards from your your hide, be ready to be able to make a 40-yard a crossing shot. And if you can't make that, pull your lines in a little bit closer, uh, maybe even almost run them, uh, you know, like parallel to your blind a little bit closer. Because, again, as the ducks approach from the water, that's just going to look like a raft of ducks sitting there. So um, you don't have to worry about the decoy placement as much, in my opinion, on that, as long as they have good good uh, flyways to kind of get up into those pockets where they assume the better feed is. Um, so keep that in mind. Love yeah, long the, lines. The guy, the guy I was, <laughs> the guy I was hunting with. So we took everything out in a canoe, and then he took the end of the long line as he's walking out. I would just clip a decoy on and put it in the water. Boom, he's going just like you know every so many feet, another decoy, another decoy. And I was like, just keep going. I'll tell you when to when to drop it. And then once I got to the end, I just walked my end out where I wanted it, and boom, set up. Yeah, easy so, day, man. Super easy. Too easy. Yep. Cool. All right. Next question. Recommend a pair of good late season gloves. This one comes up a ton. Mm. Do you want to talk about, I can talk about my setup, what I do, or (laughs) because uh, usually I hate wearing gloves. I'm not a glove guy, but sometimes it gets to the point where, where I need gloves and what I do, um, pretty much if I'm to the point where I need gloves and I will wear my Delta decoy gloves without the liners in them 
and it'll end up being I only wear my left one that I'm holding my gun with. Everything else, my my right hand's open. It goes in a pocket. Um, I did acquire a muff this year, which hasn't changed the way that I really do anything so much. It just keeps my my hand warm, and you know you can put a, a heater pack in there, or whatever you need. But um, there's a lot of options out there now, and I think the main thing for me is just keeping a glove dry. It doesn't matter what glove it is, but once you get everything set up and if you're moving decoys or whatever, keeping a set or a pair dry that once your hands get chilly, you can put them in and warm them back up. That's that's the biggest issue that I have. So I never wear them for a full hunt unless I'm wearing that Delta Deke on my left hand that um, I'm gunning with. Yeah, I, I, I'm with you. I hate gloves, period. Don't wear them hardly at all. Even in the coldest of temperatures, I don't wear them. Um, what I will say is, if you, I mean, your your options of, of a late season glove that you'll be able to manipulate your calls, manipulate your gun uh, safely, you know, put your finger in the trigger housing and, and stuff like that, uh, that list is going to be very, very short. Um, it just, it's just not something that I've come to know much of uh if you're out there listening and you got something that works good i'd love to hear it but um, what i've done is i've gone to the muff um, because for a long time it was either hands in the waiter pockets or now i'm handing the muff because i can keep you know hot packs in there and stuff like that but i cannot and i don't like to run a call with the glove on at all either hand ever and i don't like to shoot with gloves on either i like to feel the dexterity uh on my safety i just I don't like it. So I, I don't wear them, but, um, I have the Delta decoy gloves. Um, I like them. I run, if I use them, I'm using them only to set up and put, uh, pick up decoys. I run them with the lining in them. Um, any glove that's going to be waterproof, whether it be, you know, those simple, um, uh, those Harbor freight ones that are like welding gloves where they got the rubber outer coating with the, the, the knit kind of inside, those work great like for the picking PVC up gloves, decoys, but you're not going to shoot. You're not going to shoot your gun with those on. It's just impossible. Um, so I would say the best late season glove is a multiple glove approach. <laughs> have a heavy one for when it's really cold and you're setting decoys or right if you're in the blind right before shooting time or something like that. But then as shooting light comes up and you're getting like your best flight of the morning, I would scale down what I've got and try to use your pockets more or try to use a muff. I love the muff for me. That's very, um, it's a very useful piece of uh, kit for me when I'm hunting and it's one that's become sort of a mainstay for me. So uh, that's the best option for me. A late season hand warmer is better than a late season glove. Uh -uh. I'll tell you what I have. I have been using the Sitka gunner gloves, which they are a leather glove and they are very, uh, you get a lot of dexterity at them. I did when I was up in Maine and had the negative 50 wind chill, I had the Delta Deke on my left hand and I did shoot the Eider with, uh, with a gunner glove on just because any, any skin that was bare up there was starting to hurt in a matter of seconds. So, um, I did wear those there. I wear those out in the field a lot, but still shooting, it's usually a bare hand just cause I like the feel of the, the trigger. Yeah. And obviously we both, as I've said, as we've said, we both have Sitka varieties of gloves. There's a million other gloves that are just as good and will do the job, okay? There are other options out there. Um, it, what I would say is try try the different ones out and see what's going to work for you and understand what you're trying to get out of it, right? Like if you're trying to shoot with these gloves on, you have to go in like with some sort of like thought that, hey, they're going to have to, there's going to only be a limit to how bulky they can be to where I can actually do what I'm trying to do. So I think, you know, having that thought process when you're looking for that glove and trying on as many as you can to kind of figure out where that sweet spot is, is something you can consider. And, uh, you know, I, I remember, you know, growing up, some of these, some of these gloves, the best gloves I ever had were like some of these just like little knit ones that were, had great dexterity and they weren't real heavy, but they were super warm. You know, so, so trying different things that you may not think would be a great choice, uh, sometimes end up being a really good choice. So don't discount certain gloves just because they're not like big and bulky enough that you would associate warmth with. Uh, look at some of these more streamlined ones that uh, are just, you know, well-made and, um, you know, can really do the job. So, you know, 
I don't know if we actually answered that question or not, but that's my two cents on it at least. Good late season clothes. We we talked about what we do. Yeah. Seems to work. All right. Let's go on to the next one. Uh, This is a question we hit like it's definitely up there. And I'm I'm phrasing it in one way. We get it a bunch of different ways. But the way I'm phrasing it is people want to know, is it worth it to upgrade your shotgun? Right. We get all the time guys saying, I shoot a Stoger. I shoot a a Remington 870. I shoot a whatever. You name it. And they say, but I'm thinking I want to go with the Super Black Eagle 3. Or I want to go with an Extreme 400. Or I want to, you know, Rite's got these new guns. Whatever it is. They want to know is it worth it to upgrade their current shotgun to a new one basically? And they look for recommendations. They look for people with, uh, you know, who have used them and they want kind of like, they're sort of looking for validation on, on the shotgun purchase potentially. So what are your thoughts on that, Dan? It's funny. Cause when I, when I saw this question, I thought you meant like upgrading, like upgrades to your shotgun, not Negative. upgraded shotguns, but um, to this point, I think it's the, the worth it thing is really, um, getting to me lately. Cause what, what is it worth to you? Is it worth, you know, not having jams or is it worth, you know, is that a, a weekend vacation to you and the wife? Is it worth spending that money on a new shotgun? Is it, you know, what is, <laughs> what is a $1,800 shotgun compared to what you're using? Is it worth it to you? You know what I mean? Like, is it is it a drop in a bucket to you, or is it a life changing amount of money? And the worth it thing is is really just something to consider. You know, obviously, if you're asking this question, then you probably have the finances in place to make that decision if you want to. Going from the thirty nine oh one Beretta to the A three hundred was a huge jump for me, not financially. But just the way that that gun operates is night and day, and it's just a it's a big upgrade. It's a, a much stronger gun. It just feels like it's better built, and the action and everything about it is stronger, harder. Um, just really no issues with it. So they're more expensive for a reason. They have more durable parts. They're weatherized most of the time. They have easier functionality. So is it is it worth it? Yeah, there's a reason why they're eighteen hundred dollars versus six or seven hundred dollars, and I think if you have the money and the worth it part is not uh, a big deal to you financially, then then yeah, I, I would say go ahead and go ahead and do it, or at least go and depending on what you're looking at it, go and shoulder it. If any one of your friends have the gun, go and shoot it to see if you actually like it, and and go from there. Yeah. So this one for me is in my, this is my opinion on the situation. If you're looking to buy a new shotgun or you're considering buying a new shotgun, I would always approach this from the position of, I want to buy a new shotgun. I don't need to buy a new shotgun. Okay. You can go out and kill ducks with an 870 pump action Remington that you've had for 25 years. Absolutely deader than dead. Shoot your limits. Right. You can do the same thing with the Super Black Eagle 3. You can do the same thing with a A300. You know, there is there is no need, quote, air quotes here, need to upgrade if you have a shotgun that functions, right? If you want to, then yes, it's worth it. Because as you go up, you will get more features and benefits from the different price tiers, right? So maybe you're interested in coming from a pump shotgun to an autoloader shotgun, okay? So now the question is, is it worth it for me to go to the $1,800 model or is the $600 or $700 model going to be sufficient, okay? So that's more where your weight comes in. Um, it's not because you need to. It's it's your weighing about what you're going to get for your dollar, right? What you can afford absolutely should be your number one thing. You should buy what you can comfortably afford. And the good news is, there's probably never been more affordable, good options on the market in that mid price range. And I'm calling that from the $600 to $900 price range, right? In that price range, you can get great offerings from, you know, Beretta, Rite, um, Franke. There's probably others that you can get. Benelli, you can get them in that price range and be 
absolutely satisfied. You know, we both shoot A three hundreds, seven hundred dollar gun. I've had no issues with mine. Guys out there that shoot the A four hundred stream, double the price, great experience, no problems with them, right? On the on the flip side, every one of us out there knows someone who owns an eighteen hundred dollar shotgun that's a single shot that they just can't get it to work, right? Everybody out there knows someone that's had a a, a cheap uh, lower end auto loader that hasn't worked either, right? So like I think the perception that, well, if I buy an expensive shotgun, it's going to perform flawlessly is a mistake. And then it's also a mistake to think, well, if I buy a shotgun that's only six or $700, it's not going to perform well for me. That's also a mistake, right? Those options are there now, right? So what I would say is approach it from a position of, I want it, I don't need it, right? Because need, as far as being able to successfully harvest ducks, I, I can't tell you that you need it, right? But if you want it, heck yeah. I mean, then, okay, evaluate what you're looking for and how you want to upgrade and and then go from there. But if you have a Stoger and you're saying, oh, do I need a Benelli Super Black Eagle 3? You don't need it. Do you want it? Probably. Every, you know, who does? Those guns are great. Why wouldn't you want one? But you have to evaluate, you know, that money, you know, if you, if you got the money to spend on it, that's great. Or, you know, maybe you say, hey, you know, I think another thing that people can take a look at uh, in today's day and age, and I've, I've seen this firsthand this season, and I know a lot of guys have done the same. Um, for me personally, before I would look to upgrade my firearm, I would uh, I would consider taking some money and upgrading your ammunition and at least try some of these um, those bismuth or the tungsten or these other non-toxic loads and just see what that can do for your performance because, you know, Every gun goes bang. It's w- but what comes out of that out of the out of the business end is what kills the bird, right? So working with different chokes, different loads, really dialing in your setup, that might be better money better spent. I don't know. That's up for you to decide. But it's something that I would probably consider if you're looking to make that jump from a you know uh, a, a six hundred dollar shotgun to a eighteen hundred dollar shotgun. So that's kind of my point on yep. my position on it. Um, Again, the worth discussion has come up a lot lately for us in our Facebook group. Um, that what you place on value is going to be different than what another person places on value. So only you can decide that piece of it. But from the actual hunting aspect of it, the need, like need is a need. Like I need to need this to hunt and kill uh, birds. And that's not a that's not a, that's not an accurate argument. You want, right? Yeah. I want an auto loader. I yeah. want a super black Eagle three. I want the the timber pattern on my gun. I want this. It's not a need. So it's up to you whether you feel that that's worth it. I would just consider those things before you make that final decision. If you're one of my close hunting buddies, though, you're probably going to get peer pressure for me if you ask me that question because I'll just tell you to go buy another gun. <laughs> there's, there's, I'll never say don't go buy another gun. Well, I mean, just me, I think that that's okay. So I would look at if I had a, if I had a, let's just use Stoger. I have a, an M 3000 Stoger shoots three inch shells and it performs for me and I don't have any issues with it. Right. I would look at what I have in my kit and what $1,800 would get me. So are my decoys squared away? Is my camo squared away? You know, is there does my dog need training? Like, like there's a lot of other things that you, that you could probably check that box with before Mm -hmm. you say, you know, let me replay something in my kit that already performs well for me. And I've done well with, let me just, let me just upgrade that when I still don't have, you know, I'd still like two motion decoys, but I haven't bought them yet. You know, it's like whatever. So, I mean, just kind of thinking about it again, most people listening to this show always want to buy new shotguns, right? If you, (laughs) I mean, who, who doesn't love, owning more shotguns. That's never a bad thing. But in a world where a lot of times resources are not infinite, you got to make decisions. You know, I would just say, make sure that you're making them for the right reason and that you're thinking about the, the big picture. Yep. All right, let's move on. So here's a good one that comes up a lot. A good beginner goose call. Everybody wants says, all right, I bought my bad grammar uh, subscription, got my membership. Now I need a good beginner goose call. They hit up Dan Hrushka. Dan, what recommending, what call do you have for me as far as a recommendation? This is a tough one, and I'm not 
sure where I stand on it because, <laughs> <All right. laughs> and I've, I've thought about it a lot, but you know, we had, uh, Scott Trinan on and what did he say? He said to go and buy an expensive call or a, a upper level, you know, acrylic call because it can do everything that you end up wanting it to do. And at the same time, I know that a lot of people want to spend, you know, 30, 40 bucks. And when you see these really good callers, they can make any call sound good, right? So yep. if you have something like bad grammar that can teach you the proper ways to do it, and I guess it just comes back to, you know, how much do you want to spend at that at that time point? Do you want to spend 50 bucks or do you want to spend 150 bucks? And I think I my first call was given to me. I had a call given to me, but then my first call that I bought was a straight meat, a foil straight meat acrylic. And so, I mean, you're talking 130 bucks and it could do more than what I could do with it. You know, it, every note that I wanted to hit, I could hit with it. And it was very uh, satisfying to be able to hear that where on a lower end call, you might not get those crisp tones and, and everything that you really want. So I guess kind of figure out what you want to spend on it and then we can start talking from there. But I'm still, I'm still not all in on going top notch on a call before learning the basics of it. Yep. I'm you definitely, I mean? I'm definitely not. Definitely not. And Scott trying to know more about goose calling than I'll never know that I'll never, you know, he can call better in his sleep than I'll call on my best day. No question. But, I cannot recommend someone who's never picked up a goose call before go out and buy a $150 call. I cannot do it. Um, if you want an acrylic and you want a call like that, I would say buy, try to find a used one. Okay. And, and here's where I think, uh, the, 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 where the one thing I can, the one argument that I can see being made for that is a lot of guys, if they're calling and they're not getting the sounds that they expect or the sounds that they hope to hear, I think a lot of people will want to blame the call, right? So if it makes you more confident having an acrylic call in your hand, then do that. But I would try to find one used on the secondary market or something like that. If if you have if you're reasonable enough to say, you know, I'm learning, it's not going to sound great right away. Like it's going to take time. Um, you can learn on twenty and thirty dollar calls. You know, the field proven. Um, uh, I'm drawing a blank on it. The uh, Polycarb Raptor. Um, uh, that that's yeah. a thirty dollar call that can sound great. Uh, there's many other ones. Uh, the the Delrin calls. You know those are a little more solid material. You get those in the fifty sixty dollar range. Uh, those are good options. Um, you know there there are a lot of options. Like because if you buy a hundred fifty dollar call, you call for it on it for two weeks and get frustrated and disappointed and you quit. That's a waste of your money, right? So. You've got less risk buying a twenty or thirty dollar, you know, zinc power clucker and trying that out and saying, "Huh, okay." Like, I get that I'm blowing into an, a, a polycarb call. It's not going to be as crisp, it's, but you know, you're still learning the mechanics and you can tell that you're progressing. You'll, you know, you'll know when it's time to go to something different. And every call is going to be a little bit different as far as ease to blow. You know, as far as how much air pressure it takes and all of those, all of those different things that kind of go into it. But at the base of it, they all work in the same off the same principle and being able to manipulate the call. Well, comes down to the mechanics of how you do it. So to me, you can practice those same mechanics on a 20 or $30 call as you do on a $150 call. Cause what, Anybody out there that's watched Bad Grammar, you'll know that Scott does this. When he's trying to teach you how a sound is supposed to sound, he flips the call around and blows it into the other end, right? So he wants you to hear his tongue cutting the air and the air being presented into the call, right? That's the mechanics. That has nothing to do with the fact that that call is $150. He's, you know, th that's the important thing that you need to realize is that it's so much about mechanics and presentation, not so much the call that you're doing it into. Um, at least to start, in my opinion. So that's right. where I'm at and with that, it. And the same thing, you know, if you can go to a, a store and try a few different calls or go to an outdoor show, whatever it may be, go and try different calls. Because, you know, if I told someone, <laughs> if someone told me when I was first starting out to go and try uh, an expensive Molt Gear call, 
which I'm not the greatest caller in the world, but I can call geese in and kill them. I have trouble with the molt gear calls and I don't know if my hands are too fat and just not, I'm just not that good with my hands to where I can, you know, manipulate the brag pressure on the EX3. And that's what I, I bought one and I just, I couldn't, couldn't get a hang of it. So if I told someone to go spend a hundred and some dollars on, on the acrylic call there and they couldn't do anything with it, then I'd feel pretty bad too. So go out. It's almost like a shotgun shoulder it, you know, go out, try it out and see if it's something that you can play with. Yeah. And I would think too, one other thing to keep in mind and um, you know, if you're getting your first goose call, it might be more important to consider the length of the call and the, the length of the um, you know, the, the exhaust piece on that call compared to the barrel the, yeah, yeah the actual material because a shorter barrel call is going to be more demanding on what you do with your hands to create proper back pressure and get the sound you want you get a longer barrel call it's going to be more forgiving and it's going to allow you to make more mistakes and not require so much of you as a caller having great hands right so things like that are probably as as important if not more so uh when considering buying your first call compared to well should i get a polycarbonate or an acrylic you know kind of thing so all of that stuff plays into it. And like I said, I agree. Go to a show if you can. Talk to some call makers. I mean, I know a lot of these guys that make calls. You call their shop and just say, hey, like, this is what I'm trying to do. Like, they'll they'll work with you. I mean, these guys are just like, you know, they're just like you and me. They're just hunters, right? And they love talking hunting. And if they make calls and they pay their mortgage making calls, you call the shop and ask them questions. They're going to be into it. You know, they're going to want to talk to you about what you're trying to do. And they're going to try to satisfy your needs. So uh, don't be afraid to ask for help with the people that can give you the help, right? So I don't think there's yep. anything else. And a lot of the times, a lot of the times when you call the shop, it's the owners that you're talking to and, and they know ins and outs of every call. So don't be afraid to, to take that route for sure. Yep. No doubt. All right. Next question. Why does Dan report fake news? Ooh, this is <laughs> awkward. <laughs> so I've been going to the same site, you know, trying to acquire knowledge and, um, it's funny because in call it, this is a random fact that's actually a fact. I, <laughs> my home, my home page in college on my computer used to be like a, a useless knowledge website. So every time I'd open up a web page, the first thing I would see would be the the useless knowledge fact of the day. So I've always enjoyed reading some of that stuff, and now I just have to I have to vet my sources because apparently Coca Cola was never green. I think it was in green bottles for a certain point, but as far as the actual color of the beverage, it never was. And I got called out real quick on that one. Yeah, I mean, in so the world people, of... People world are fact-checking. I was going to say, in the world of fact-checking, I got a, a private message on Facebook that says, I found the answer to this in less than 30 seconds with one hand while I was driving. So I'm like, oh, oh snap. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is unfortunate. So. Yeah. I yeah, think, I got uh, owned on that one. Yeah, <laughs> I think the I think the response is we're just gonna do better. That's all. <laughs> we'll we'll do better. I'll you know I'll hit up Snopes before uh, before I bring it on air. That's <laughs> that's where I'm at. All right, let's move on. Uh, we got a couple more questions. This one here is a really good one that comes up a lot, and this one's right in your wheelhouse. So I'm gonna let you take first crack at this. Um, people want to know about wearing fishing waders for duck hunting. So whether you've got a nice pair of Sims waders that you wear for fly fishing, or maybe you've been um, fly fishing and you want to get into uh, duck hunting, but all you got is a pair of uh, you know, fly fishing waders. Um, Everyone wants to know, can we wear that duck hunting? I'm worried about the boots coming off in the mud, all that kind of good stuff. So that's Dan's setup. So I'm going to let him take this one. Go for it, Dan, now. For sure. The Sims have been a godsend, and I know there are tons of more uh, breathable waders on the market. But uh, my, I think my biggest problem or my biggest issues going into that was the stocking foot versus the boot foot. And when I was looking to buy, um, I was going to get the boot foot, but they didn't have the boot foot in my size. So... When I was looking, I was a little scared. I reached out to a bunch of the guys in Montana that had been wearing the Sims for a long time, and they said, no, go with the stocking foot because if you're going through mud and stuff, you want the stocking foot. Like, your foot does not slide in that at all, and you don't – I wouldn't say you don't get stuck as much, but I have had, like, zero issue with my boot moving whatsoever. And then, you know, the breathable waiter, it's just – 
so much better than neoprenes in in every aspect and if you layer correctly you're gonna you're gonna make it through it still i still cringe when people say when it gets cold i I go to my neoprenes and it's just it's mind-boggling the difference yeah i think the biggest thing here is you know you're seeing more companies going to breathable waders so i think that a lot of people are making that transition and realizing that it can be done i think the bigger point to this is that you know if you've got fly fishing boots with stocking foot waders you can wear those duck hunting. I mean, you can lace them up and you shouldn't have any problems with them, like getting stuck in the mud or any kind of th- stuff like that. So um, layer up, put on what you got and get out there and get after it. You know, you start hunting more. You're going to realize you, your hunting waders are going to take a beating, a absolute beating. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you may want to get something different or you may want to get something a little more rugged maybe than what you got or whatever. But no, to start, the fly fishing waders are good. And, you know, a lot of guys are still wearing those. A lot of guys are going to stay with those. You know, Sims makes a great product. Um, LL Bean makes great ones. You know, a lot of Orvis, a lot of great companies out there make good fly fishing waders that can also dual hat for hunting. Because let's be honest, waders are expensive. It's a great opportunity to be able to check two boxes with uh, two birds with one stone. If you get a great pair of waders that you can wear in the duck blind and on the trout stream. So definitely a great idea. I'm a huge fan of that, of that idea. If you can get yourself into that. All right, here we go. Uh, Last question that we're going to hit here, Dan, and this is also a really good one, I think. The question came in to us is, what's the best way to repay or show appreciation to someone who's taking you on a hunt, uh, you know, like if they lease a property or something like that? So um, what's a good way to show your appreciation to someone that says, hey, come out to the lease and uh, join me in my group or whatever for a hunt? I would say, you know, even though it's a free invite, I would be you know, asking how you can contribute, whether it be breakfast, whether it be gas to get there. Um, but I think almost more than that is being, be a good time. You know what I mean? Like be there on time. Don't be the person that stands out as being the, the turd of the group, you know, go and have fun and, and really make it, make it a good time. But there's always, there's always something you can do either adding to the, the fuel bill or whatever it is. And then you can always, you know, finish up with whatever their favorite case of beer is or something along that line, you know, get them a, get them some whiskey or, or whatever it may be, you know, make, make sure they know that it is appreciated that they, they thought of you to invite you out there. Yeah. I mean, I don't think that most guys, again, I could be speaking out of place here, but I I don't think that you know, if, if me and a group have a lease and I invite you on a hunt, I don't think the expectation is that you're going to pay, pay me to come hunt that. Right. I mean, right. you know, I've leased it or other groups leased it where it's for our enjoyment. You know, we want to, you know, we invite you because you, we, we want to have you have a good time with us or whatever. So I don't think the money piece is exactly where I would go with this. I think you hit a good point, you know, be a good dude, you know, just be a good hunting buddy. Right. I mean, that's sort of general all, all the time, but I'm going to take it one step further where you said, ask, what can I do? You know, can I do this or can I do that? In my opinion, don't ask, just do. That means show up with donuts, show up with coffee, you know, do what you can that you know that they will appreciate and don't, and don't, don't don't ask for their permission. You know, bring donuts to the blind, bring coffee, whatever it is, um, bring breakfast Mm -hmm. burritos, bring something. Um, I think that goes a long way to, to showing, you know, Hey, I, I appreciate the opportunity that you're giving me. Uh, the other thing I will, I will say too, is like, You know, make sure that you tell them, say it like, hey, I appreciate you letting me come out here, man. Honestly, I've had a blast today. Thank you. Right. This this takes me back to, um, you know, anybody who is out there who has prepared for a job. Right. And you're getting ready for the job interview and you go through all these things and you're like, I want to answer questions like this. And these are my strengths and all this stuff. And you got you got it all planned out. And it blows my mind when you're interviewing people, how many people forget to just stake Put your foot in the ground and say, I want this job. I'm the best for this job for these reasons. I want this job, right? You can you can do the same thing with duck hunting. You know, you can assume that they that they know you appreciate it, right? You can assume that, like, hey, you know, they invited me, so like whatever. But like, go out of your way. Say it. Tell them, hey, I appreciate you guys letting me come out here and join you on this hunt. You know, that goes a long way. People will remember that kind of stuff. Because I guarantee not everybody does that. So Never make assumptions as far as what they believe that you're, you know, how, how grateful they believe you are. Tell them, always tell them. And then two, um, you know, 
show up, breakfast, coffee, whatever. And then three, just do your part, set up, pick up, clean up, you know, whatever it is, brush blinds. Don't be, you know, don't be a turd. You know, just do, do what you got to do to be a, a positive part of the hunting group. And I think that, you know, that's the best way to go about it. And, uh, you know, again, I, 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 my biggest thing is just to make sure that you tell them how much you appreciate it. And it's, you know, yep. and, and that, that, that candid, um, you know, moment just kind of saying, Hey guys, I appreciate it. I've had a blast. Thank you so much. goes a really long way. So, um, and you know, and depending how, even if they aren't the best buddies of yours, you know, they invited you next time you have a banger hunt or you have a good, uh, a field, a good scout going on, you know, make sure you reach out to them and, and try and pay that back. Yeah, absolutely. That's another so, fantastic point. If you've got an opportunity, pay it forward, you know, Hey, um, you know, uh, Dan, I got a feed that, you know, we got it. We need like two or three more guns. How about your buddies that, you know, that we met, you know, had over at the lease that one day, you know, uh, you know, Tim and Joe, you know, are they cool. Like the, would they be available want to come? You know, that kind of stuff is, is, is definitely what it's all about. And that's how you build out your network. That's how you get invited on more hunts. You get invited on more opportunities to do different things. So, um, Yep. The the biggest thing I would say is the fact that someone's asking the best way to repay or show your appreciation, you're already going in the right direction, right? I mean, the fact that you understand that you need to be appreciative of that opportunity is 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 half the battle. So, yep. Um, yeah. All right, man. You got anything else to add on any of those questions or anything? Any questions that you wanted to hit that we didn't cover here? No, um, I was, I was just going to say, you know, keep sending them in, you know, we try and respond I, I it's, it's really weird. Cause you know, we've been doing this for what, four and a half years now. And, and we try and get back to people like ASAP and people are really thankful that, that we do respond so quick. So, you know, if you have a question, if you're getting, if you're new and just getting into it, you know, shoot us that message or wherever it's at Instagram, Facebook, our email, um, you know, we do our best to, to get right back to you and, and we always have time to help out. So, um, that's kind of why we started this, you know, we're trying to bridge that gap between the, the new and veteran hunters out there. So, so shoot us a message if you, if you want a opinion from our side. Yep. And I, I mean, I've told people straight up, they send me a question. I'm like, that's a great question. I don't know. I don't know what I would do in that situation. Here's my thoughts. Could try that, but you know, it, it if nothing else, it can be a dialogue, right? We're more than happy to just shoot the breeze and say like, you know, hey, this is my scenario. What do you think? Because, I mean, we learn from that stuff too, you know? And it's like nobody out there has hunted at all and nobody knows everything. So you know, a lot of times just kind of getting a couple people together and chatting it up spurs new ideas and, and good opportunities. So don't be afraid to send us your questions and we'll do our best to get back to you. And, uh, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll try to do these types of episodes periodically so that uh, everybody can kind of learn from the questions that we're, we're getting and we're talking kind of having on the side. So, uh, that's, that's kind of all what we want to do is make sure everyone has an opportunity on those things. So, uh, all right, Dan, I think that we've covered the questions we're going to cover for this week. Um, what else you got that you want to hit anything? Dude, I think I've been in the urgent care like five times in the last two weeks. And, uh, what is it? It's almost 11 PM right now, Saturday night that we're, finishing this up and I have two kids crying upstairs. So I think we're about good to wrap it up and I'm going to go, you know, take care of daddy duties and then go from there. Yep. I think I've never seen anybody deal with more illness and sickness than your house than you have in the last week. So dude, so many, you know, two with the flu and then a, a sinus infection and the wife is on steroids and an inhaler for her lungs. And she usually has zero issues and just can't stop coughing. So me and the boy, we're, we're holding strong for now, but next week might be a different story. Yep. So that's where I'm at. Only a matter of time, bro. <laughs> yep. <laughs> well, let's go ahead and uh, wrap this week up before we do. Just want to again, take a minute to thank quack rack gunner kennels, 737 duck and goose calls and done sporting goods. And of course, this episode was driven by Cornerstone Gun Dog Academy, the world's most comprehensive online gun dog training resource. They've got over 160 instructional videos, including everything that you need to take a seven week old puppy to a finished gun dog. Head over to cornerstonegundogacademy.com, sign up for their pre free preview module, and begin your training journey today. 
Quarterstone Gun Dog Academy, the most advanced gun dog training resource on the web. And with that, we will go ahead and put a bow on this week. All right, that does it for episode 119. Hopefully you guys enjoyed our conversation about some of the questions that we get from you, the listeners. And if you've got questions out there that you're sitting on or you're wondering about, shoot them our way. More than happy to chat with you about them and do our best to kind of help get you pointed in the right direction. If you're new to the show, head over to iTunes, check out the old episodes, get all caught up. We love five-star ratings and reviews and all the good stuff that comes with that. So until next week, for Dan, I'm Josh. Take care. Take care.